The challenges facing our world are growing all the time. How do we build stronger economies with equal opportunities for all? How do we build a sustainable world for generations to come? How do we protect our cities and harness the power of technology for our common benefit? Humanity has always been good at forward thinking. We will make sense of the problems of tomorrow. Inequality, sustainability, urbanization, the gender gap, and the demographic time bomb. The world is changing. Today we stand on the brink of a fourth industrial revolution, one that will transform the way we work, the way we live, and even what makes us human. There's a, a group of technologies that are combining to create transformation across almost every industry at the moment. And those technologies include things like artificial intelligence, 3D printing, robotics, um, big data, and then some things in, on the sort of life sciences front in terms of genetics and, and uh, medical imaging. And that these things are sort of combining in a way that's bringing about a host of transformative changes across industries. I would describe the fourth industrial revolution actually quite similarly to how I would describe the past three, and that is technology that leads to massive gains in productivity. And massive gains in productivity mean substantial improvements to everyone's quality of life. The world has been through revolutions before. The advent of mechanization, then electronics, then the digital revolution all profoundly changed the world's economies. But this revolution could be even more disruptive. I think in previous revolutions, you could really talk about them as industrial revolutions. What was changing was how things were made, factories, industry, often heavy industry in particular. Here you're seeing transformation across really a whole range of not just industry, but services and, and the creation of whole new business models that didn't exist before. What's different a little bit about this particular revolution is that um, it gets into a whole range of things that people only thought were ever only possible for humans to do. Jobs that were human jobs before aren't going to be human jobs anymore. At the heart of this fourth revolution is artificial intelligence. The ability of machines to match and perhaps one day surpass the cognitive ability of their human creators. What's happening now is a big deal. Um, it is making a big difference in the way people live, uh, the way people interact with each other. It is sort of obliterating distance. It is, in some cases, removing humans from tasks that we once thought were the sole province of the human mind. These analytic tasks that we thought only a human brain could do, we're suddenly finding that algorithms can do, that machines can do. These are early days in the brave new world of artificial intelligence but the potential benefits are vast. What are some of the liberating benefits of artificial intelligence? There are actually a lot. Um, if you think about something just like driverless cars, autonomous vehicles, which is one use of AI that people are talking about, that could have a really liberating um, impact on a lot of people's lives. If you think about older people who can no longer drive, they're very shut in their houses right now, very dependent on others for transportation. With driverless cars, they would be able to go about their daily life. And then you're seeing with big data that this may have a profound impact on drug development, that you'll find um, new pharmaceuticals being developed at a faster rate um, to cure diseases because the computers are essentially able to sort through the data and pick up connections that otherwise would be missed. For health in particular, the advantages of machine learning and data science are immense. Those have an incredible chance to address very, both very infrequent diseases and diseases which affect different parts of the population very differently. If we're going to cure cancer, it's probably going to come through data science. But there is potentially a darker side to this technological revolution, one which could profoundly change the world of work as we know it. A technological revolution will cost jobs. It'll cost jobs in the areas that see the biggest advancements first. A good example of that that, that is feasible over the near term is truck driving. You have self-driving trucks. You don't need the 3.5 million truck drivers that you have right now in the US. 
What is key, as part of this revolution, as productivity goes up, as the economy continues to evolve and new jobs are created, you need to make sure those displaced workers are given the skills to move into these new positions. That's what's key. Will all of them be? No. But I think the key point is you need to make sure if you've lost 3.5 million jobs in one sector, how do you create more than that in another sector? And I think in past industrial revolutions, that's what we've seen happen. And hopefully, uh, and I think it will, it will be what happens again. But what if this doesn't happen? Martin Ford is a software entrepreneur. He has peered into our future economy and sees a world where potentially hundreds of millions of skilled workers are out of a job. I would say that if you look far enough into the future, there is no job anywhere in our economy. There is nothing that anyone does that is completely safe. And that includes even artists and novelists and you know the kinds of jobs that you would imagine right now are completely beyond the, the scope of artificial intelligence. Millions and millions of those jobs are going to be lost and it's unlikely that enough jobs are going to be created to absorb all of those workers. Martin Ford is a software entrepreneur who has a chilling vision of the future. His best-selling books have put him at the forefront of a movement which worries about technology, the speed of its growth, and the immense potential it has to change the world. This is the fourth industrial revolution, the advent of machines powered by artificial intelligence, which have the potential to make redundant hundreds of millions of workers across the planet. It is a world which is nearly upon us, but which governments and businesses are only starting to comprehend. Well, the central idea in my latest book, The Rise of the Robots, is that over time, uh, machines, computers, smart algorithms are increasingly going to substitute for human labor. I think that that's inevitable. Um, technology is eventually going to be able to do many of the things that people now do, and I think there's a good chance that that will result in unemployment. It's going to push people out of the labor force. Many people are going to find it impossible to adapt to that because they're not going to have capabilities that really exceed what machines can do. And that's, I think, going to be a genuine concern both for our society, of course, and ultimately for the economy too. Some of those machines are already with us. Well, there are already algorithms that can interpret things like body language and um, respond to some extent to emotion that can determine your mood, for example, and so forth. And, and you know, this has big implications. Imagine what that could mean, for example, for advertising. If an algorithm can determine exactly how you're feeling and then target advertisements at you based on that. Some of the language trans translation things that have been demonstrated are truly remarkable. Imagine if anyone in any country who speaks any language would now be able to do any job uh, because we have perfect uh, machine translation in real time between languages. So, you know, that has real implications for the job market, obviously. We may already be starting to see the effect on the wider economy. In the first decade of this century, the net total number of jobs created in the United States was zero. What we see is that in the United States, we've been having what we call jobless recovery. So um, clearly there's something happening there. And I think part of what's happening is that jobs disappear when a recession happens and then when finally recovery comes back, companies find that they're able to leverage technology to avoid hire, rehiring a lot of those workers. And so it's taken longer and longer for the jobs to reappear. Throughout history, technology has always disrupted economies and societies. In the late 19th century, 50% of US workers were employed on farms. By 2000, it was less than 2%. Those workers found work in other sectors, but Martin thinks this time, it's different. What transformed agriculture was a specific mechanical technology. Uh, now we've got a technology that's really just ubiquitous. It's across the board. Artificial intelligence is something that's just scaling across our entire economy. It's not something that's impacting just one sector. 
is something that literally is everywhere. And as a result, it means that there isn't really going to be any safe haven for workers. What makes the new technology so ubiquitous is the development of a new virtual world, the world of big data. Well, big data essentially is the collection and use of just massive amounts of data. And in big corporations, for example, these companies are collecting all kinds of information about uh, their customers, about their business operations, about the actual processes in, in, in industrial environments and factories, um, about the things that their employees are doing. All of this data essentially becomes a kind of feedstock for these smart algorithms. It, it becomes the information that they use to learn and, and basically to figure out how to do things. And um, that's something that is just going to be, I think, dramatically disruptive going forward. The total data stored on the world's computers is now believed to be well over 1,000 billion gigabytes. And it is big data which is driving the most disruptive advance in technology, the ability of machines to think. One thing that you'll very often hear people say, even today, is that computers only do what they're programmed to do. And you know, this is really not right anymore. And, and the reason it's not right is basically because of machine learning, because we now have this technology that allows smart software algorithms to look at data and based on that to, to learn, to learn how to do things, to figure things out, to make predictions. So it really is no longer the case that some human being is sitting down and telling a computer exactly what to do step by step. Uh, computers are now having the ability to figure that out for themselves. You can imagine a future where every device, every appliance, all kinds of industrial equipment, everything communicates and talks to, it, to each other. And I think that one of the things will happen is that artificial intelligence will kind of use that as a platform. It will scale across all of that. Everything will become more intelligent. The last great technological advance saw robots replace millions of blue-collar jobs in factories and on production lines. Martin believes this new disruption is going to target the white-collar workforce as well. Once a, a computer learns to do something, then that, that information can be scalable out to any number of machines. So it's almost as like you can imagine having a workforce of people and you could train one employee to do a particular task, and then you could clone that worker and, and have a whole army of those workers. That's a bit like the way artificial intelligence works. So machine learning is, is very scalable. If you've got the kind of job where someone else, another smart person, could maybe watch what you're doing or study everything you've done in the past and figure out how to do your job, then it's a pretty good bet that eventually there'll be an algorithm that will come along and be able to do, you know, essentially that, that same approach. So um, that's a lot of jobs. Many of the jobs which might be displaced are those currently occupied by educated, highly paid workers. So you can see really across the board that um, anyone sitting in front of a computer doing some sort of routine, predictable knowledge work, for example, if they're cranking out the same report or the same analysis again and again, all of that is going to be very susceptible to this. Journalism is one interesting area that's being impacted by this because there are now systems that can essentially tap into data and then they can transform that data into a very compelling news story that, that many people would read and, and they can't tell that it was written by a machine. In the future, maybe 90% of news stories will be machine generated. The number of jobs displaced has the potential to utterly transform the economic landscape. There have been a couple of studies done, most notably by a couple of researchers at Oxford University, and they've looked at a number of countries, and most of the results have come back suggesting that up to half of the jobs could be susceptible to automation, perhaps over the next 20 years. That's 60 million jobs in the United States alone. That's a staggering number. And obviously, we have a massive social problem. You'd have tremendous stress on government in terms of trying to take care of all these people that no longer have an income. Um, I think that you would see uh, the potential for a massive economic downturn because you would run out of consumers. You no longer have people that are capable of buying the products and services that are being uh, produced by the economy. A revolution on this scale wouldn't just transform an economy, it would have immense implications for our society.
we could really have just what you might call inequality on steroids. The very wealthy people who own all this technology are going to do extraordinarily well. You would have the potential for civil unrest, perhaps even riots or massive crime waves. In the United States, during the Great Depression, we had an unemployment rate of about 25%. And back then, there were many people genuinely concerned that that would result in the collapse of both democracy and capitalism. This situation amounts to just about the end of the world as we know it, a science fiction nightmare straight from the movies. There are some very prominent thinkers, like, for example, Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, who have raised genuine fears about the potential for advanced artificial intelligence. And their concern is that someday we're going to build a super intelligent machine. Imagine a machine that's a hundred or maybe a thousand times smarter than any living person. Uh, what would that system think? How would it act? Would it have a use for us? Uh, it might decide that we're simply a burden. It might decide to just get rid of us. Uh, so it could potentially present an existential threat. Uh, is that something to worry about? I think that it's not a silly concern. It's not something that we should laugh at and just dismiss. There's really no end point to this. There's no point at which you can say, this is absolutely as far as we can go and, there, and machines will never go beyond this. We are reaching a new era, a time when things are going to operate differently and we need to adapt to that. Healthcare is one area of the economy already adapting to this disruption. And in this field, researchers hope that intelligent humans and intelligent machines can work together for everyone's benefit. The fourth industrial revolution, the era of artificial intelligence, has arrived. Computers are now mastering tasks once considered the sole preserve of humans and putting millions of jobs at risk. And now business leaders are wrestling with the potentially huge implications. In general, robots of one form or another are going to become much more omnipresent in our lives in a good way. They'll replace a lot of repetitive activities that people are currently doing. Robots will have a dramatic effect on the labor pool, lower the cost of products. People will start to realize that just about every manual task eventually will probably be done by a robot. Martin Ford's books have highlighted the threat to the job market, but even he sees areas where artificial intelligence could be beneficial. I do think that, that healthcare is actually one of the areas where the impact of artificial intelligence and robotics could be extraordinarily positive in the future. The burden on our economy is growing at a remarkable rate, especially in the United States. So if we can deploy more artificial intelligence and robotics there to make that more efficient, that'll be a great thing. Analysts expect the AI healthcare market to generate revenues of over $6 billion by 2021. 10 times its current total. Young companies like Heinzate in New Jersey and Enlitic in California are mining data to improve patient outcomes across a range of illnesses. And in New York, IBM researchers have developed Watson, an intelligent software system at the forefront of this revolution. It can understand somebody's personality type. It can look at email, for example, and tell you what is the tone of the email. Uh, you know, what kind of messages are coming through, whether you internet them or not, right? Uh, it can look at, uh, for example, a big encyclopedia and extract all the concepts and the relationship among those concepts. Watson operates in the world of big data, extracting knowledge from the billions of facts and figures floating through cyberspace. I look at the world from the point of view of, uh, you know, the amount of data that there is, um, and the amount of knowledge that is embedded or insights that's embedded in the data that we're not able to extract today, and therefore we are not able to make the right decisions. So um, the fourth industrial revolution to me is the ability to have a much better understanding of the world through all of the data and therefore making better decisions for it. IBM is currently running a research project in which Watson augments the intelligence of medical professionals, helping doctors treat the most dangerous diseases in the world, including skin cancer. 
Melanoma is a very deadly form of skin cancer, and it's something where early detection and intervention is, is key. So a dermatologist faced with a patient who has a skin lesion will make some assessment about the likelihood of a lesion being melanoma. So unfortunately today, dermatologists can make errors. Some melanomas are being missed, and some skin lesions which are perfectly benign are being excised needlessly. So what we can do here is essentially ask the computer to make a deep analysis over an image. So this image is then being sent to the computer and it's being automatically analyzed. And what the computer is telling us about this image is that there's a very high probability that it corresponds to melanoma. What we're finding in our own internal retrospective research is that the computer can be as accurate as 95%. So this compares to the best clinical experts today that are between 75 and 84% in recognizing melanoma. It is not a tool that would replace uh, the clinical expert. Uh, rather, it provides them with additional analysis over the skin lesion images uh, by providing reaches into large databases of uh, similar lesions. This is a vision of a future where humans and machines work hand in hand, complementing one another's skills. I look forward to a, a time when you know, every professional, in fact, you know, two, three billion professionals around the world are all able to have their own personal cognitive assistant that can help them do their daily jobs. And that changes the nature of expertise. Humanity will move to a completely different place in terms of expertise and how we apply our knowledge and our experience into real world problems and therefore make the world a better place. Just like uh, we've had um, machines that could um, augment people's muscles in the, in the prior industrial revolutions, uh, or uh, can help people you know, search vast amounts of inf information, like in the, in, uh, in the internet era, I look at the next revolution as machines augmenting people's cognitive capabilities. Um, that's how I think about it. Martin Ford remains cautious, believing artificial intelligence is going to fundamentally change the way we live and work and challenge us like never before. We're not prepared for the disruption that's coming. We're going to see things get worse before they get better. In particular, the impact on the job market and the impact on the incomes and the livelihoods for average people. So. You know, in the short term, things could be pretty difficult, but in the longer term, if we do adapt to this, then I think there are reasons to be really optimistic. I mean, you can imagine an almost utopian kind of future where no one has to do a job that's dangerous or that they really hate or that's really boring, where technology takes on more and more of that. And um, if we can get to that point, of course, then that's a tremendously positive outcome. So I think that all of that is really possible and it could be one of the best things that's ever happened to humanity, but it will require that we adapt to it. And uh, that's gonna be a staggering challenge. This is the age of the city. For the first time in human history, more people live in urban than rural settlements. The world's urban population is growing by 70 million people each year. 301 cities account for 50% of global GDP. This will rise to 66% by 2025. So if we don't get things right in our cities, then the consequences for humanity are profound. Cities are critically important to the global economy and to progress in the global economy. Cities can be sources of chaos as well as development. This dual personality of cities is what makes them so alluring and so vital. They can be dangerous places, but cities are where fortunes can be made. One of the primary uh, factors driving urbanization is opportunity. You live on a farm and you're growing crops you don't have a lot of opportunity. You see a bustling, growing city. Your friends are moving there. They're getting uh, jobs in offices, maybe jobs in a, in a manufacturing center. Uh, there's restaurants, there's culture, 
there's life. This, this is attractive. Uh, this is attractive and something you want to be a part of. And everything is relative. You know, they'll have greater access to schools, greater access to health care, greater access to employment, and a much less vulnerable uh, economic life. In 1900, 12 of the world's biggest cities were in North America or Europe. 100 years later, this number had fallen to just two. Most of the biggest cities of the future will be in the developing economies of Asia and Africa. Most of the growth in cities is going to be in China, India and Nigeria. Those three countries alone will account for 37% of the world's urban population. Just staggering numbers. Here's an example, Lagos, the biggest city in Nigeria. Its population every year is adding the equivalent of the population of Boston. The urbanization rate in the US, Japan, it's over 70%. In China, it's still 50%. So China may have a lot of mega cities, they may have a lot of larger cities, but those cities are either gonna get bigger or there's gonna be more of them. So I think that's gonna be a trend. And I think a, a lot of emerging markets, especially those with uh, large populations, uh, are going to experience trends like that uh, in the next 50 years. This incredible rate of growth makes the challenges of managing a large city even more difficult. The biggest risks facing cities are the same risks that challenge all of us. Uh, politically, uh, governance, uh, climate change, uh, economic uh, inequality, uh, productivity, economic growth, employment, education, transportation, those issues that, that face cities are the same that face everyone except on a, on a much, in a much more concentrated way. One city battling with many of these problems is Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Alessandra Orofino is on the front line trying to solve them. She believes the world's biggest cities are in danger of sinking under a tide of poverty, decrepit infrastructure and citizens' apathy. And unless we do something about it, billions will suffer the consequences. The kind of urbanization that we have today can only go so far. If we do not change the way we design our cities, if we do not make cities change with us, we're going to have very serious limits to urbanization. Cities will become impossible to manage, impossible to live in, and just very miserable places to be. I think if we change that process, those limits could change dramatically and potentially be non-existent. But that requires that we think deeply about the environments that we want to be in and how we can better build them together. Managing mega cities is one of the great challenges facing the world. This is Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Nearly 12 million people crowd into its metro area. It is beautiful and vibrant, but it also has its problems. Crime, inequality and poverty. Alessandra Orofino is an urban activist and thinker who has lived and worked in megacities on three different continents. She has worked with the United Nations on its sustainable development goals and founded the groundbreaking Mayo Rio, an NGO that uses data gathered from citizens to raise campaigns and solve thorny issues posed by the rapid growth of the city. Mayo Rio has 170,000 activists and Alessandra hopes it can become a model for other rapidly growing cities around the globe. We build upon a rich tradition of neighborhood movements, not only in Brazil, but all over the world, and try to sort of bring it to the 21st century in a way that makes sense for people. I was born in, in this city, in Rio de Janeiro, and my family has a very sort of mixed background. My father comes from a neighborhood in Rio that was quite dangerous in the 90s, uh, quite poor. Uh, or lower middle class, and my mom comes from a very wealthy background, one of the best neighborhoods in Rio. It, it taught me that this city can be amazing, but it can also be very rough and unequal, and that's not just a characteristic of this city. I think it's something that we are seeing increasingly in cities around the world. 
Rio de Janeiro is similar to many emerging megacities. Some neighborhoods are as wealthy as anywhere on the planet. Others remain impoverished and cut off. Bridging this gap will, Alessandra believes, have profound benefits for us all. Cities bring people closer together, and they have this intensity in them, this density in them. They are definitely the places where most innovation will naturally happen because it's very hard to innovate when you're always talking to the same people and hearing the same thoughts. And cities are the exact contrary of that. They are uh, natural hubs for innovation, natural hubs for economic growth, and they tend to be the engines of growth in most countries. But when this growth is rapid and unplanned, the results are gridlocked streets, poisoned air, and an infrastructure that simply cannot cope. Well, I come from a city that expanded too rapidly, for sure. How do you create sidewalks, sewage systems, schools, mobility systems uh, to cater to a growing population? If that rapid urban expansion is happening in environments where inequality is paramount, uh, the challenges are even bigger. In a megacity, one of the biggest challenges can be simply getting from A to B. Our mobility systems, in general, very few exceptions, suck. When you have a poor mobility system, you just preclude entire segments of the population from living the city, from actually accessing the opportunities and the beauties and the amazingness that cities have, right? Because it's very hard for them to get around. You also preclude the rich people in the city from getting to know other areas in the city, which can be incredibly exciting and a, and a fulfilling experience in and of itself. So you're creating a city in which everyone is living in their own territory, which is terrible. At the forefront of these infrastructure problems are the city's poor. They can become physically cut off from the economic opportunities that living in a city provides. The poor pay the brunt of most things, and I think that includes uh, rapid expansion of cities. The fact that in the developing world, one third of the population is living in slums is something that none of us should accept um, as, as we grow and as we think about the planet in which we want to live. Slums are a result of rapid, unplanned expansion. Today, an estimated 863 million people live in slums. If the 104 million slum dwellers in India were a separate nation, they would be the 13th most populous country in the world. But slums are not always hopeless places. The poor are not just sitting, waiting for the government to do something for them, they're creating their own urban environments. So if you go to a slum in Rio, you see that most of that infrastructure was built by the community itself um, over the years. So there is a level of do-it-yourself, a level of initiative that you see a lot more in poor neighborhoods than rich neighborhoods precisely because the government wasn't there. This means slums must be handled delicately by urban planners. What do we do with areas that were developed by communities but lack infrastructure? Even if we're assuming goodwill in terms of how we handle them, even if the only thing that we want to do is provide those areas with good quality public services, there are choices that need to be made in terms of which pieces of that infrastructure do we leave, which pieces do we change, knowing that it was built by the people. If we don't handle that process in a way that is human and intelligent and actually aims at protecting the interests of the poor communities, we can end up with massive waves of dislocation and, and, and destroying an urban fabric and a social fabric that is so important and so vital. Here in Rio, we have a neighborhood called Santa Teresa. And in that neighborhood, we have a tram. It's a historical tram, it's beautiful. Uh, most trams in Rio were destroyed um, in the, earlier in the 20th century. Uh, in Santa Teresa, the neighbors organized and kept their tram. It's a point of pride for them. Santa Teresa was a forgotten neighborhood for a while. It became a lot poorer. Uh, and then in the past five to six years, it has been gentrifying really quickly. And the government decided to turn that tram, which is one of the very few remaining in the city, into a tourist attraction. But what the neighbors said at that point was, 
the only reason why this trend still exists and it's vintage and kind of hipstery and amazing, it's because we organized and we kept it here. They created that value. They created the richness of that community. And we see that all over the world. Alessandra believes cities often ignore this creativity. The result is a democratic deficit which erodes faith in the city's government and alienates already vulnerable communities. Alessandra believes cities must take their citizens with them if they are to expand successfully. I think what we have definitely not gotten right is the process by which we involve citizens. I have not seen one case of a city that has really used the collective intelligence of its citizens and, and distributed power in a way that makes it actually possible for people to influence the way the city evolves. And when we get that, that right, I think we'll solve a lot of the other issues that we see. But for us to truly harness the power of our cities, we need to heal the divisions within them first. If we keep building unequal cities, cities that are not sustainable and cities that are not very good to live in for most of their population, I don't think we can actually hope to be happy in these urban spaces. The worst case scenario for the global city of the future would be cities that do not have a soul and therefore become less and less attractive to entrepreneurs, to people who do, who do want to create new economic activity and that ultimately also become less wealthy. Across the ocean from Rio, another giant city is growing. Lagos is now the most economically important city in Africa, but its growing pains are excruciating and threatening the futures of 21 million people. More people live in cities than ever before. But many of the world's biggest cities are struggling to cope. Lagos, on Nigeria's Atlantic coast, is the largest city in the world without a city-wide rail system, meaning everyone has to travel by road. For workers like Abraham Cole, this means his daily commute takes over his life. What time did you wake up? This morning, I woke up like 3 o'clock, 3, 3.30. Well, I usually don't do breakfast because it kind of slow me down. In three years, the population of Lagos has nearly doubled from 11 million to 21 million. But this staggering expansion has overwhelmed the city's impoverished infrastructure. How long should it take you to get to the office? It should take me four to five minutes to get to the office. But in full traffic, in full rush hour, how, how long does that take? You probably would do like some six, seven hours in traffic, three hours going, three, four hours coming back. It's much worse coming back. Coming back is, is, is something else. And I don't think I want to waste seven hours of my everyday time for the rest of my life. Lagos is currently ranked in the top five least livable cities in the world. But although the city's economy is bigger than Kenya's, simply getting to their desks is a daily ordeal for its millions of workers. So when do you see your children? Weekends. Weekends only. Sometimes I see them during the week if they really want to see me and they're keen to see me. Sometimes they miss me that much. That must be quite difficult. Yes, it is, but it's what we have to do. For now. Like millions of Lagosian workers, Abraham's first act on getting to work in the morning is to take a nap. There we go. Welcome to my office. <laughs> so what, what are you going to do now? I think I have... Yeah, this is quite early. This is 7.10. So I'll take a nap for like 30 minutes and get ready for work. 
2,000 people migrate permanently to Lagos every day, straining the city's infrastructure further and expanding the city from the land to the sea. The result is slums like Makoko, a floating settlement on the city's lagoon. The infrastructure has not kept pace with the population growth. So basic measures of quality of life, just as access to clean water, for example, access to electricity are, are limited. So before you even get to issues related to uh, growth and, and development, uh, Lagos and Nigeria have to sort out much more basic issues of infrastructure. Makoko is the oldest slum in Lagos. 80,000 people live here in buildings sitting on stilts, connected by a complex system of canals. Successful cities find ways to deliver services to even the most, uh, most deprived. And that's, that's the challenge, especially in the developing world where resources are at a, at a premium. In Makoko, residents have developed their own infrastructure, including fresh water and electricity. And this three-story floating school, which doubles as a community center, is the latest addition to this unique environment. The school was completed in 2013. It is cheap and easy to build. Its designers hope it will become a template for future buildings in Makoko. Makoko in Nigeria raises interesting questions of governance and control. For example, uh, it's been a uh, long ignored area and the local residents took charge and tried to improve their own lot with schools and with their own locally initiated development projects. However, the central government also has decided it wants that area for its own development reasons. Only a few kilometers away lies an alternative vision of how Lagos might develop. Not a grassroots community vision, but a grand project of incredible scale. Echo Atlantic. Well, where we are standing, we are in the alignment of the financial district, what we call Echo Boulevard, or some people call it our Fifth Avenue. This is where all the major financial institutions will establish their headquarters and offices. Echo Atlantic is a multi-billion dollar residential and business district built on 10 square kilometers of reclaimed land. It is, in effect, a new city, or it will be soon. Its backers hope a quarter of a million people will one day live here, with 150,000 workers commuting from the old city across the water. When we initially started to conceive Echo Atlantic, uh, obviously we looked at um, Canary Wharf in London, we looked at Dubai, and if you look at the heart of London, part of Paris, part of New York. Obviously, uh, the vast majority of the residents are wealthy people. I couldn't afford to live in the heart of London. But it, in creating the residence for these people, you're also creating job opportunities. And it is the, the norm here in Nigeria that when you create a residential apartment, you also create um, quarters for the domestic staff working for that family. You have to take it into context that this is uh, a city development. It's not a, a low-income settlement. It's, it's a business centre primarily. This is the future for the commercial development of, of Lagos. There's no doubt about it. David hopes the first residential units will be open by the end of 2016, with the infrastructure of the whole site in place by 2022. Projects like Eco Atlantic raise as many questions as, as they answer, uh, especially from where, where local residents are, are aware that they may be getting the short end of the stick. On the other hand, they really do lend themselves to uh, starting from scratch and being able to build structures where there are schools, hospitals, offices, uh, transportation facilities, and they, they give gigantic cities like Lagos an opportunity to create a model 
of what can be, presuming they're, they're planned and executed correctly. The future paths of mega cities like Lagos remain uncertain. Organic, citizen-led growth like Makoko, or large-scale planned development like Echo Atlantic. What's clear is that left unchecked, growth could destroy cities' immense potential. I'm an optimist when it comes to cities. I grew up in New York City in the 70s when the city went to the edge of bankruptcy. And here we are in uh, the 21st century and New York is, is booming and thriving and uh, it's a tremendous place. And you can see with proper planning and, and a diverse and vibrant population what's possible. I hope that those global cities will be extremely interconnected in the sense that they will have solidarity networks, in the sense that they will have resiliency networks, and in the sense that their citizens will feel like their city is where they want to be, their city is the, is the sort of the project that they want to build, but that they can move, they can visit each other, they can learn from each other at, at the global stage. The world of work is still dominated by men. In the Middle East and North Africa, only 25% of women are economically active. Globally, three quarters of unpaid work is done by women. And even in North American companies, 25% of female employees feel their gender has held them back. If women are half the people, they should have, you know, a fair shot for all of our benefit at contributing to the economy in a way that is really much more equal with men than maybe what we've seen in the past. Of the biggest companies in the world, only about 5% are run by women. On corporate boards, less than 20% of the decision makers at the corporate board table are women right now. In the U.S. Congress, only about 20% of the elected officials in both the Senate and the House are women. Women earn about 79 cents on the male dollar. So there's all kinds of ways in which women don't have parity in the world in which we live. This is the gender gap, and it's been around for a long time. The organizations that have a lot of power in our world, the elected government, uh, big companies, the education structure, the medical systems, all of these things are really dominated by men at the top. And that's largely a result of the history of the 20th century and before that. And it is taking a while for women to break that, what we call the glass ceiling. But at the same time, it, it's taking a while for the whole society to adjust to seeing men and women as equal actors at the top of any of these institutions. Nearly 100 years after women in the United States were guaranteed the right to vote, the gender gap remains an issue in every corner of the world. <laughs> and closing it has become more than just an issue of fairness. It has become an economic imperative, debated at Davos and in boardrooms across the world. The gender gap matters for business. It, it, you know, it's, the, it's the market opportunity, as well as the potential loss to, uh, to the bottom line. When you have a, a company and a workforce that represents your market, you're more likely to succeed. By having a more diverse workforce, uh, companies tend to be uh, more successful because they're able to more creatively address uh, challenges uh, and, and issues uh, and uh, you know, in innovation. Uh, and so if you have a boardroom or a, a committee entirely composed of individuals who all went to similar schools and have similar backgrounds and think the same way, uh, they're going to be less successful uh, than a very diverse board. In a study that came out last fall from McKinsey, um, they found in looking at a, a big global uh, number of companies and looking at economies around the world that in fact equalizing women's economic contribution by 2025 would add 26 trillion dollars to the global economy. So you know there's really very big numbers related to um, women becoming more equal in terms of economic participation wherever you look around the world. Evidence is mounting of the positive effect female voices can have at the very top of businesses. If you look at companies where you find female CEO or chairwomen, you know, those are companies where you don't have uh, poor corporate governance, they don't have poison pills, 
They don't have unequal voting rights that keeps uh, you know, insider management in control. They don't have um, staggered board elections. Companies with good governance are more likely to have um, female CEOs. So the question is, with the issue at the top of the economic and political agenda, what is holding women back from the very top? Is it lack of ambition or simple old-fashioned sexism? So uh, if we look at uh, professional women in the workforce, about 43% of them uh, leave their profession at some point to deal with care of uh, most likely a child, but also uh, care of elderly relatives. It's very difficult to re-enter your profession uh, at the same level as your male peers who have been present for those last 10 years. This explanation rings true for former senior State Department official Anne-Marie Slaughter. She believes that what is holding women back is the structure of our workplaces and societies. And if we don't do something about it, then our corporations and governments will continue to underperform. There's no global issue that would not be helped by advancing women or achieving equality. We want a world in which every human being boys and girls, has the right and the ability to live up to his or her God-given potential. And what we have is a world in which far more men have that ability than women do. Once upon a time, women were promised they could have it all. But something is holding women back from gaining and retaining the very highest positions in business and government. Anne-Marie Slaughter has reached these heights in her career. For two years, she worked for Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, helping to shape the long-term goals of US foreign policy, and now runs the Washington DC think tank, New America. But it was a 2012 article in The Atlantic, which she subsequently turned into a critically acclaimed book, which cemented her reputation as one of the most intriguing and thoughtful commentators on the question of women in power. The feminist movement is about equality. It's about women being able to have what men have always had, which is to be uh, fulfilled uh, in a job, to, to be powerful if that's what you want, to do important work or work that is meaningful to you, and have a family too. And I still believe that women and men can do that. I think there's nothing that stops us in principle from doing that. But what I now say is we have to make really big changes still if we're going to get there. Because as work is currently structured, as we think about careers, currently structured, far too many people do have to make a choice. And far too many of those people are women. This was a choice which Anne-Marie Slaughter had to confront herself. Work in the State Department at a high level is work that depends on the state of the world. And the world is unpredictable by definition, and there's always too much work to do. If there's a revolution in Egypt, you can't say, hold that, I'll be back on Monday. You have to be there when it happens. So I definitely worked pretty much you know, very long hours for two years. When I went to the State Department, my family understood that they were gonna sacrifice so that I could do something I really wanted. They stayed in Princeton, I worked in Washington. I left home at 5 a.m. on Monday mornings, and I came back late on Fridays. And that was difficult, but I understood that that was what it took to do this job. My oldest son was entering adolescence when I left, and he had a very stormy period. Uh, so much so that he started making really quite bad choices. A number of times I would just jump on a train and go home, you know, in the, in the middle of a day, and, and Secretary Clinton was incredibly understanding. But after two years, we realized that it really was a choice between putting all our energy into helping him get back on track with real important life consequences, uh, or you know, getting promoted in a career that I had, I loved. The decision to quit her dream job and leave Washington didn't just affect Anne-Marie's career. It challenged the feminist credo by which she had lived her life. 
I saw the world differently. I realized that I had been telling women for decades, <laughs> young students whom I taught, you can make it work. You just have to you know, work hard and you can make it work. And I couldn't make it work. And if I couldn't make it work with all the advantages in the world, I had money, I had a husband who was a lead parent, I had every possible way to make it work. Well then, you know, then there are places where we simply have to make choices. That was an epiphany. Anne-Marie's decision to put caring for her family before advancing her career saw her accused of betraying feminism. When I wrote my Atlantic article, I got a great deal of criticism from uh, women of my generation or older uh, who were feminist women I admire, uh, but who very much worried that I was setting the movement back. If I told people I'd come back because I wanted to be with my family, I got a reaction that essentially told me, among many people and many women, that they saw me a little differently than they had before, that I wasn't really a player, that I'm, I wasn't as motivated or ambitious as they thought I'd been, kind of disappointed. Anne-Marie's experience sparked a debate about whether women can have it all. Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg had suggested that, in order to get ahead, women needed to be more assertive in the workplace in the face of male power. They need to lean in more. I admire Sheryl Sandberg and I admire what Lean In has done. I've seen it as somebody who runs an organization. I have seen young women come in and ask me for raises, and I know that they've just read Lean In. You know, they're, 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 they're doing it. You know, they're pushing themselves forward in exactly the way uh, that Sheryl Sandberg recommends and, and many women uh, advocate. And I agree with all of that. I think it is a debate uh, about where to put the priority. Anne-Marie believes the problem lies deeper, not just in women's individual behavior, but in the way business and society is structured to make it almost impossible for women to have a career and to care for a family at the same time. That's a full-time job, and somebody has to do it, and women have traditionally done it, so women are still expected to do it. So what you're doing is asking people who are uh, holding two full-time jobs to compete with people who are holding only one. So if a woman is the primary caregiver for her children or for her parents and a full-time breadwinner, she's competing with people who are doing only one of those. That's like running a race and having half the people you know, put a pack of rocks on their back and wondering why they don't advance to the finish line at the same pace. Instead of saying, well, that's something that women should still do while they're also working, we need to say, Parents should have the time and the space to be able to care for their children and also work. But that requires a much bigger shift in thinking. The effect of the gender gap can be seen across the global economy. Rates of prime age employment for women have been falling in the United States for nearly two decades. In 2014, just 70% of women aged 25 to 54 were in work. The comparable figure is higher in Scandinavian countries, and these are the countries where the gender gap is at its narrowest. The countries that have gone the farthest toward real equality are the Nordic countries, Denmark and Sweden and, and Finland and Norway. What they understand is both that you have to recognize that raising children is a social and economic investment and their governments say we're going to invest in maternity leave and paternity leave. And the paternity leave is particularly important because they uh, create incentives for men to take not a week, not two weeks, but up to six months. Uh, and they do that in part by giving one month or sometimes two months as a kind of use it or lose it. So the man's an idiot if he doesn't take the month to be with his children, uh, when if he doesn't do that, he just he, he loses that leave, right? That's crazy. If sharing the burden of care of children and of parents is key to closing the gender gap, then that suggests accepting the traditional roles of men and women are a thing of the past. 
you have to be uh, accustomed to seeing men as the primary caregivers of young children. And men have to understand that they're just as good at, as women at this. Uh, and even more important or equally important in many ways, as a, a, a Finnish CEO said to me, the head of a big Finnish company, he said, now when someone comes, a young man who hasn't taken their paternity leave, I wonder about their character. And that's where we have to go. And in Scandinavia, that's where they're heading. The Nordic nations are pioneering a new approach to work and parenthood, and narrowing the gender gap in the process. Across the world, women are reaching the top in business and politics, but they're struggling to stay there. I call myself an impatient optimist. I'm impatient because the world is getting better for women, but it's not getting better quickly enough. And we need to do a lot to move that forward. And I, I would love to tell you that because I'm a female CEO, uh, I've changed the, the fabric of the diversity makeup of my own company and I'm leading by example. But the reality is, is that we're challenged in terms of uh, female representation. It's not getting better. In fact, you know, post the crisis, there was less diversity on Wall Street than pre the crisis, and one would have thought it would have been the opposite. Right. So I would take the opposite side. Okay. It's not getting better, and it's costing Wall Street a lot of money. Anne-Marie Slaughter thinks this gender gap exists because of the way businesses and government treat family life. In Sweden, along with its Nordic neighbors, attitudes are different. Scandinavia leads the world in gender equality, but its success has been hard won. I did uh, military service when I was 20 years old, and we were three women in a group out of 60 people. I came in as top 10 out of 60 on a half marathon with 15 kilos on my back, and um, they said that I was lucky. And they continued to say that I was lucky when I was at a shooting range or did my exams well. So my performance wasn't valued as much as the guys. Sophia has made it her mission to challenge this culture. Sweden is, is, is viewed as one of the most gender equal countries in the world, and we are. If we look at, you know, legislation, uh, the fact that you actually can combine family and career, and we see also that we are, are very uh, above EU average when it comes to women in the workforce. But if you look into the managerial positions, we are not there. Uh, we, we drop out and we are actually below the EU average. I think the EU average is 27% female managers and in Sweden we are 23. Sophia's job is to help smash the glass ceiling in the Swedish private sector. We are working with companies that were constructed 100 years ago. So when they did recruitment, when they communicated, when they gave feedback, when they interacted with their clients, they did that in one certain way and they still do it, but the world has changed. So the glass ceiling is basically old norms, old culture. So you have to change the culture to get rid of the glass ceiling. 80% of the global consumers are women today, and they are powerful. They have more money than before. 64% of the university graduates are women. So the future is female. If you don't know how to meet, predict their needs. You will not be here. While Sophia tackles business culture, Swedish family life is already moving towards parity between men and women. So, <laughs> Sophia splits the care of her two children equally with her husband, Harry, who also has his own demanding career. For me, as a CEO of another company, uh, I work hard, I get up early, but I'm also totally focused from five till eight on the kids. We split 50-50 with the kids when, when they were small and before kindergarten. And this gives me the best of two worlds. I work hard, I have a fulfilling job, but I also get to uh, really know my kids. We have uh, 40 years of career. Spending six months with the kids is one of the best investments you can do. This shared attitude to parenting is typical in Scandinavia. 
TDC is one of Denmark's leading telecommunications companies, with revenues of over $3.5 billion in 2015. The company offers generous parental leave to its nearly 9,000 employees, believing it to be good for business as well as families. I definitely think that the, the, the labour market in Denmark compared to other countries are much more uh, free, giving a high degree of responsibility to our, to our employees and, and ask them to, to, to feel, the, uh, feel free to, to have a, a whole life and we see our employees as a, an, as, a, as a human being as a whole, 360 degrees around. TDC offers fathers 100% of their salary during 16 weeks of paternity leave. Like Sofia's work in Sweden, the aim is to change the culture around work and families. The result is a take-up rate of 85% and, the company believes, a happier, more productive workforce. There's uh, no doubt that uh, we have seen increased productivity levels for our employees. Of course, we can uh, attract the more competent people because we have a more balanced focus for the job between your, your private life and your, your, your work life, uh, that's, that's for sure. Senior manager Peter Jespersen is a veteran of paternity leave. He is able to split care of their three children with his wife Christine, who then feels the benefit in her own career. Peter is allowed to spend four weeks with me at home right after the baby is born. And then when I go back to work, uh, he has the, per the first couple of months, he stays at home with the kids, which enables me to um, start working without having any duties at home, which uh, then I can focus on work. I'd say that, that what other countries or, and other people probably could be missing out on is, is, is two things, probably. I think one thing is the family side. I mean, both parents get to know their children. They get to know their preferences. They get to know who they are. And I think on, 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 on the work environment, the workplace, I think there's numerous studies that shows that equality, if you promote equality, being both having women in, in top positions, women in managers' jobs, and women in the workplace in general, uh, you, will, you, you will be more successful So, so as, a, as a society as a whole. Moves towards gender equality in Scandinavia have not happened by accident. They're the result of a deliberate, long-running strategy. I think it's critical to how we live now and how we go forward that the gender gap and broader issues of diversity are part of the conversation. And that is really because of the way the world is changing. The gender gap is part of it and it's not going anywhere, so it's important for us to talk about it. I want my daughter to grow up in a world where she can be anything. So I think it's about you know, breaking norms and enable both men and women to be who they are. Gender equality is a huge piece of cultivating and harnessing human talent. And that's the way to think about it, that we need all the talent we can find uh, because we have enormous problems, uh, because we need economic growth, because we need innovation, because we need to save the planet. Uh, we need human ingenuity, uh, creativity, intelligence, and half of that talent is in women.